So we are in this series called Didn't See It Coming, and we are basing this series off of a book that was written by um, an amazing leader and actually a friend of Jer and mine. His name is Carrie Newhoff, but it's called Didn't See It Coming, and it's about overcoming challenge that no one expects but everyone experiences. And so we're kind of diving in um, to one of those subjects today. Well, I don't know about you guys, but when I get to heaven someday, I am going to have a long list of why questions for God. Anybody else gonna have a long list of why questions? Well, one of my why questions is going to be this. Why do we have to eat three times a day? Or I guess it'll be past tense then. Why did we have to eat? three times a day. And everyone who is the preparer of meals in your home, whether that be one person or for seven people, you said aloud, amen. Why do we have to always eat? I cannot tell you how many times I have been like, you know, at work and then on the way home, what I end up doing is driving home, it's like, you know, 5.15 or so, and I literally am like, "Um, okay, I have to get home and I actually have to figure out what I'm going to prepare for dinner. And I'm like, shoot, I didn't plan enough head, so I'm gonna stop at Mary's Market and pick something up because I have not prepared anything to eat. I tell you what, I get so frustrated because I'm like, okay, God, I'm gonna make this meal at nighttime and then I'm gonna have to go to sleep, I'm gonna have to get up, I'm gonna have to eat again in the morning and then I'm gonna have to eat again at lunch and then I'm gonna have to eat again at dinner and the cycle just keeps going. Has anybody else ever thought about this? I'm like, why, God? All the moms, why? Three meals a day. Why do I always have to eat? Well, really, my goal, and one of my questions, God, is why I can't be like these certain animals. The first one would be the great white shark. The great white shark here, I wanna be like him, okay? He only, or her, I don't know (laughs) which gender that is, um, but I'm sure she's fierce, so it's a girl. Um, And so, (laughs) do you know that great white sharks can go literally weeks without eating anything? Weeks without eating a single thing. And then there's bears, okay, bears. I really, once I was kind of looking into this, I felt a little lied to because you know that bears don't hibernate? I felt lied to by my elementary teachers. They don't hibernate. Now they sleep more, but they don't, it's not like they climb into a cave and then they come out like, you know, and they don't wake up for three months. Well, bears can actually go um, almost 100 days without anything to eat. Yes, 100 days. The last is here the snake, or the next one is the snake. Ew, right? Totally grossed out. How many of you just got really like, ugh, snakes? Now, I don't know what kind of breed of snake this is, but there's certain breeds of snakes, okay, that can go, listen, almost an entire year without eating anything, eating anything. Now I know why sharks, bears, and snakes are mean, people. They are hangry. They're hangry. They haven't eaten for weeks or months, almost a year. Okay, they are hangry. But I think I'm pretty amazed by these animals. Another animal I'm amazed by who I would love to be like is the penguin. Okay, listen to what female penguins do. While the females venture out into the sub-zero temperatures to hunt, the males sit atop the nest, keeping the babies warm for two to four months. That's a girl's trip right there. I am in. I'm going out to get dinner. I'll be back in two to four months. Have fun warming up those babies, okay? Do, 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 do. (laughs) I want to be a penguin. Sign me up. Um, So, well, with all that, I'm just saying, I really wish that I didn't have to prepare so many meals. I always feel like I'm hungry, I eat, then I'm hungry again. Then I eat, then I'm hungry again. Our lives, you guys, are a lot like our hunger. Once we get filled up with what we thought we wanted or needed, we just find ourselves hungry again. Always needing more to feel full. We just need more to feel full, okay? So our hunger, our physical hunger, is kind of like life sometimes. It kind of goes like this, right? We're not dating. You know, we're not, we don't have a, a significant other, and we, um, we really want to be dating. And once we're dating, we've been in there a little while, then we want to be engaged. And then once we're engaged, you know, we're really like, we can't wait to get married, all right? And then once you get married, you can't wait to have kids. And then once you have kids, you want to sleep. 
That's what you want. You want sleep. You don't want more kids. No, I'm just kidding. We want more kids. Um, but you want sleep. All right. Or then there's kind of like other things, you know, in life where you get that job promotion that you wanted. You really wanted that next position. Well, then you get that position. Well, then after a while, you're like, well, I want, I want more. I want, I want a better position. And then maybe you get like a certain pay raise and you're like, yes, I've been wanting this pay raise. And then after a while, it's just not enough. So you're kind of like, well, I really would like to have some more. You know, I want more. Um, it can be this way with goals, right? Like we set a goal, we accomplish a goal, all right? And then the kind of like the, we did it and the ma we mastered that and then all of a sudden, it's like we want another goal. We need another goal because we, that hasn't kept us feeling full. Now here's the deal, you guys. These aren't exactly uh, bad things. They're not necessarily bad things that we're trying to fill ourselves up with. In fact, some of these are good. And do you guys know that it is okay to have good desires? to have hope for better things. That's not a bad thing, but hope and hunger are two totally different things in my book. Okay, so, um, but even this, this is what I know, even if we are filling ourselves with good things, they don't keep you full forever. You know that. Even good things don't keep you full forever. That, that spouse will disappoint you at some point. So it's just, it's just part of life. So, but then there's the other side of the coin. All of us at some point have tried to fill our lives, okay, I don't care who you are in here, all right? No matter what age, all of us at some point have tried to fill our lives with things, the culture, society, or maybe even curiosity promises to bring fulfillment, joy, purpose, pleasure, happiness, and yet after we've tried yet another relationship, right, or we've gotten what we wanted, or you know, we did what we wanted, we felt the high, we had another drink, we spent the money, we bought the next thing, we had the better thing now. Once we kind of, even with bad things, right? We have, we come to this point where we're like, is that it? Is that it? You know, because here's the truth, okay? In an honest moment, okay, whether we're filling ourselves with good things or whether we're filling ourselves with not so good things, we have all find our, found ourselves asking this question, is that all there is? Or saying to ourselves, is this all there is? There has to be this word, more. Everybody say more. More. There has to be more. So today, we're talking about the subject of emptiness, of emptiness. And I have a question for you, okay? What would the perfect life look like for you? What would the perfect life look like for you? Now listen, it's gonna be different for all of us, okay? Some of you would say the perfect life would be if I lived by the mountains, the perfect life would be if I lived by the beach, that doesn't count for you, Cape, you know? The perfect life would be if my spouse treated me this way. The perfect life would be if I had this certain amount of money, if I had this better house, or if I had this better car. Whatever it might be, you feel like, I want you to pause for just a second. I want you to picture, what would the perfect life for you consist of? What would the definition of it be? So now I know what you're thinking now, that you have this picture of the perfect life in mind. You think to yourself, if I just get all of that, if I just get it all, okay, then I won't want the word we talked about, more. I won't want more. I won't want more. But here's the problem with that, okay? That really is a lie because here's the deal. There are people who have your definition of a perfect life. They have it, okay? They're, they're people who have the thing that you want. And do you know what they have? They have their definition of a perfect life. <laughs> and they want more. And so at the end of the day, the definition, it doesn't matter where you are, who you are, a lot of times, it's, it's just not going to be the thing that fulfills us. This is the reason why, you guys, because our appetites for things, listen, our appetites for things are just like our appetites for food. We are only filled for a while, and then we're hungry again. And we need more, and we want more. We need more and we want more. It's just the way life is, 
right? And so today we're gonna be talking about a gentleman in the Bible, his name was Solomon, all right? And we're going to be kind of diving into some verses in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now Solomon here was a, uh, he was a king that was found in the Old Testament. And he was actually the son of a great king named King David, and when King David passed away, Solomon became king. Now here's the deal, you guys. David, or King Solomon, all right, here, here's the deal. We think we want every, you know, like we want, we we wish we could have all these things. Solomon actually had all the things. Okay, he had everything he could ever wanted. He was king. Some of you in here, you have a t-shirt that says princess or queen or king. You just wear the t-shirt, okay? Solomon actually was royalty, okay? He was royalty. He wasn't just wearing the t-shirt, okay? He actually was, and he had everything he needed. He had the perfect life. Solomon's story and his writings are found in a couple of different chapters in the Bible. Um, Solomon basically did this, okay? I want you to hear this. Solomon basically lived his life and as an experiment. Everybody say experiment. Experiment to see what could bring true happiness and fulfillment. And after he had lived much of his life and exper experimented with all of the things, and I mean all of the things, okay, he thought would fill him up. This is what he said about life. It's found in Ecclesiastes chapter one, only the second verse. He says this, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, which means himself, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. A different translation says it this way, in my opinion, nothing is worthwhile. Everything is futile. So here's Solomon, okay? He's had it all, he's tried it all, and this is his conclusion, that it's all meaningless. Everything is meaningless, all meaningless. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking to yourself, Solomon just screwed it up, okay? Solomon just screwed it up, he messed it up. If you were to give me all of those things, I would come to a different conclusion, I'm sure of it. You give me all the money, you give me all the stuff, you give me endless resource, you give me all of that, and guess what? I, I will come to a different conclusion. But isn't that just like us humans, right? We have to learn the hard way. Solomon, okay, experienced all these things. He did all the things on a much grander level than any of us could ever experience them. On a much grander scale than any of us could ever, but we would say to ourselves, no, 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 give me the chance. I want the chance to have that kind of life, and I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure I will come up with a totally different conclusion, all right? But here's the deal, we like to perform our own experiments with life, right? our own experience, and we negate what others have learned the hard way. Here's the deal, in our pursuit of happiness, fulfillment, in our pursuit of happiness, for happiness, fulfillment, peace, joy, and purpose, we fill ourselves up with some of the same things that Solomon tried, and I'm gonna hit on four things that Solomon tried to fill himself up with. The first one is this, more knowledge. More knowledge, if you're taking notes, you can take out your app, you can fill that in, more knowledge, okay? Solomon wanted more knowledge, and he applied himself to that. Chapter one, verse 16 and 17, again, we're in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says this, I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, but I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind, a chasing after the wind. So here's Solomon, okay? Solomon is a learner. Now, it's, I want to note here, okay, you guys, that the things that I'm gonna talk about here, these four things that Solomon tried, they're not all bad. In themselves, they're not all bad. Wanting more knowledge, being a lifelong learner, that is a good thing. We encourage you to do that, okay? Go get your degree, graduate high school, go on to college, keep continually be a learner in your faith of the word of God, keep doing those things. Yes, 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 but this is then what Solomon said, okay? As he tried to make that what filled him up, that's where he found his meaning, his identity, when he was trying to make, this is what's gonna make me happy. This is what's gonna bring my me me meaning. He said to himself, what was that? It's a chasing after the wind. Have you ever tried to chase the wind before? <laughs> the next thing that Solomon tried was this, more pleasure. 
more pleasure, meaning this, more fun, okay? Ecclesiastes 2.1 says this, I thought to myself, this is Solomon again, come now, I will try self-indulgent pleasure to see if it is worthwhile, but I found that it is also futile. It's futile. And later in verse 10, and we'll read it in just a minute, he says this, I denied myself no pleasure, No pleasure. He did all the fun things, okay? All of the things, like, you know, the stuff that we see in the movies, you know, and online and all this stuff. We follow these people, and they're doing all the cool things. Solomon did all the fun things, okay? He party hard. He overindulged in drink and sexual pleasure. If he wanted it, he got it. He took it. He experienced it. He's a king, mind you. So not only did he deny himself no pleasure, here's the deal, you guys. He had the best of it all. He did. Okay, so it's not, like, it's not like Solomon was this like, person who was frivolously and like just, you know, he wasn't like, I don't know, drinking in his pickup truck down by the river, all right? That's not what he was doing. Sorry if you were doing that last night. <laughs> You're in the right place, in the right place. <laughs> Solomon, sorry, you all just went to Chris Farley in a van down by the river, I know you. The van, do you wanna live in a van? Give Jesus a try. Anyway, sorry, I'm coming back. I just lost myself. Um, (laughs) Sorry. He had the best, okay? Solomon had the best, you guys. He did it all. He had it all. He had the best of it all. He had the best drinks. He had the best women. He had the supermodel women, okay? He had the best of it all. We cannot even, honestly, you guys, we can't fathom what he had. We really can't. In our mindset, we just can't even fathom what King Solomon as the king had, what he had access to. But what did he say? Listen here. Listen, you guys. Listen close. Okay, what did he say? He said, it's all futile. Futile. Yes, Lord. Futile. (laughs) Which means this in its original context, okay? It means this, empty. Empty. Unsatisfactory. It was unsatisfactory. What's the third thing that Solomon tried to fill himself with so that he could feel full and whole and have meaning? It was this, more things, more things. Ecclesiastes chapter two, four through 10 says this. I want you to listen to the magnitude, okay, of what he tried to do, the things that he tried to fill himself with. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself, multiple homes. And by planting beautiful vineyards, as one does. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. And listen, you guys, anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself, there it is, no pleasure. I denied myself no pleasure. So here is Solomon, okay? He's actually um, doing what we all do. It's called retail therapy, all right? Retail therapy, that is what King Solomon is doing. He's like, in order to fill myself, I'm actually, I'm gonna continue to buy myself things. I'm going to build the homes, I'm going to build the gardens, the vineyards, I'm gonna buy people, okay? I'm going to have many concubines, I'm gonna have whatever I want. I'm gonna have the fastest horse and the biggest donkey, and I'm gonna have all the things that are the best. I'm gonna have the best. We do this as well, right? On a much smaller scale, mind you, on a much smaller scale, but we do this, right? We think that success and happiness will be found in the accumulation of things, of more things. Better car, another car, a different house, a better house, more money. If I owned this thing, if I had, you fill in the blank for yourself. If I had that, I would be happy. 
I would have meaning. I would be filled up. But what does Solomon say there, right? We're all getting smart here. What does he say there? It's all meaningless and it's empty. What's the last thing that Solomon tried to fill his life with in order to find purpose? It says this in chapter two, verse 11. I even found great pleasure in hard work a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. The last thing that he tried to fill himself with was more work. More work, and we do the same thing. More work. See, Solomon worked hard and he found great pleasure in it. Now listen, you guys, the working hard isn't the problem. Do we hear that? Working hard is not a bad thing. We want you to work hard. We should work hard. We should be representing the God of the universe when we work. We work hard, we work smart, we work good. We're hard workers. The problem with this is it was what he had worked so hard to accomplish. All these things that he had built, the homes, the gardens, because this verse right here is attached to what we had just read. All the homes, all the gardens, all the people, all the things, all the stuff, all the herds, all of the things that were just the symbol of absolute wealth back then. He said, you know what? Those are meaningless. It wasn't the hard work. It was the what he had tried to accomplish. Solomon worked hard. See, this is the thing. He started to see that all he had accomplished was meaningless and empty. You know, Carrie Newhoff in his book says this. He says, the cycle of always feeding ourselves what we think will satisfy is a very cruel one. It's a cruel one. If we just keep saying, hey, listen, this cycle, I'm just gonna feed myself. I'm gonna, uh, you know, what's gonna make me happy? I'm gonna keep feeding myself. And then guess what? We're empty. And then we fill ourselves again. He's like, this is a cruel, it's a cruel cycle. You know, we think something will work to fill us and it doesn't. Then we try something else, a different relationship, a new drug, a new pleasure. The result of emptiness is the same, yet we continue to think, no, I'm sure it'll work next time. Don't we do that? Here's the deal, too. We have to make sure that we keep this in perspective, okay, church? Is that some of you might be sitting in here if you're like a follower of Christ and you might be thinking, well, this applies to other people. We is Solomon, Do you know that? You is Solomon. I am Solomon. It doesn't matter if you are a follower of Christ or if you are someone who we walked in here today, which we are so glad you did. This is your first time and you're just curious about faith. It doesn't matter. Guess what? We all have this ability to try and fill our meaning with knowledge, fun, pleasure, things, and work. We all can do this. So now we're all depressed, right? Way to go, Jen. Um, So do we just resign ourselves to the cruel cycle of always trying to fill ourselves up and see what satisfies? How do we break this cycle? How do we break this cycle? I know what you guys have been wondering this entire time. What is this thing? It's magic, you guys. I am magic. Do you believe that? Just kidding, yeah, I know there's an explanation. You've been wondering, how does she keep pouring out, out of this vase, and then she puts it down, and then she picks it back up again, and there's stuff inside. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do in our final, you know, like 10 minutes together. We're gonna talk about life lessons from the Loda Bowl. Okay, this is called a Loda Bowl. And this is how we are going to learn how to overcome emptiness. Let me explain how the Loda Bowl works, okay? There's actually two parts of the Loda Bowl. There's the inside, okay, where I am pouring the water out of. But then in between this outside and this inside, there's actually a hidden reservoir of water. It's on the inside. So there's this hidden reservoir of water. So what happens is when I pour this out, And then I set it down, it's filled up from the inside, from the hidden reservoir that's inside. Now I know, you know where I'm going with this, right? (laughs) The loadable, life lessons from the loadable. The two parts I wanna talk about is first, there's the hidden reservoir. The hidden reservoir. This is what I want us to understand, you guys. Listen to this close, okay? I want us to understand that the emptiness you feel is God's cry for relationship with you. 
the emptiness that you feel. When you keep trying to fill with all the things, if I just attain this, if I just get this, if I just buy this, if I just have that person, if I just sleep with them, if I just have them as my wife, if I just do whatever, I don't know. If I just have that spouse, if they just treated me that way, we keep trying to, you know, like fill ourselves up with all this stuff. Guess what? All of that stuff that just goes empty, 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 when you're that emptiness, that feeling you have, guess what? That's God going, hey, guess what? I'm here for you. I want connection with you. I love you. Because what happens, what fills us up on the inside is our connection with God. And he desires that. <laughs> See, world tells us that if we just take things in from the outside in, if we just keep adding things, that eventually we're gonna fill up. The way that God works is totally different. He's like, I wanna build a hidden reservoir inside of you, the real you, the, ma the you that matters, and then guess what, then you'll feel full. Because we are, you guys understand this, okay? I, I tried to think about this this week, about um, in light of me being an incredibly imperfect parent, okay? Um, I've got three amazing boys, but as a parent, in my own imperfect way, I have this deep desire, okay, this deep desire to have a connection with each of my kids, to be there when they're going through a difficult time, to have them connect with me when they're going through something, to have them, to celebrate them when they like do something amazing. You know, I, I long to like sit at the table with them and have them a part of a meal and we discuss and we talk about life. I, I, I wanna know about their day. I wanna know about, I wanna know. It kills me to have Caden like 1,061 miles away. That's exactly what fine friend says every night when I check and make sure he's in his dorm room. <laughs> It's hard because I desire connection. And so I call and I text because, and here's the deal you guys, do you understand? Okay, do you understand? I am imperfect, so imperfect, and the way I feel about my kids is so dwarfed in comparison to how the God of the universe wants connection with each and every one of the people that he has created. I actually started to look just at people in general different this week. As I was like driving down the road, I was like, that's a creation of God right there. God desires connection with them. Do you understand that? It's like God has eight billion kids and he has the amazing ability to desire connection with each and every one of them. So whether you are in this auditorium or you're at Cape or you're watching online or you're God behind bars, I want to tell you today, somehow I was like, God, give me the ability to express to each and every person who hears this the absolute desire that God has for connection with you. He desires for you to be filled. He desires for you to have true fulfillment, true meaning, true purpose, true joy. And the only way that happens is when we have connection with the one who created us. His desire for you is so immense that he sent his son Jesus. He said, get down there. I need connection. God doesn't need you. He wants you. Do you know that God doesn't need you? But he wants you. Just like my kids right now. They take more than they give. Right? Hello, college tuition. They take more than they give, but what do I desire? Connection. And the God of this universe, I don't care where you're from, I don't care what you've done, I don't care what you walked in here with, whether you're watching, whether you're sitting, I don't care. God desires connection with you. You may have tried like Solomon to fill yourself with all the things, I mean all the things. You've done all the stuff, right? You've had all of the, the, the partners, you've had all the stuff, you've done all the stuff that makes you feel good and you're sitting in here today and you're going, I feel empty. Well, guess what? That's God's cry for relationship with you. It's his cry for relationship with you. He wants to fill you up so you have a hidden reservoir so you don't keep searching and you don't keep trying to fill yourself self up with all the things, all the things. Because I think if we're just really smart in here, we would listen to Solomon when he says, listen, it's meaningless. It's all meaningless. It's not worthwhile. It's empty. It's unsatisfactory. 
What's the second thing? Okay, well, first of all, how do we do that on a practical level, okay? First of all, stay planted in church. Get planted in a house, okay? If this isn't your church, then find a great church, Bible-believing church where you can get involved in a life group, you can get involved in connection, you can stay planted in a place where you're like, you're learning and you're growing, okay? Another thing would be this, man, dive into God's word. Some of you in here, you know what? Um, this has been, it's had a lot of dust on it. Dust it off and take it out and start reading it. And then another thing is just prayer. Do you know that prayer is, you guys, I just wanna remind us of this, okay? Prayer is just talking to God. You don't have to be in church to pray. You don't have to be super spiritual Christian to pray. God wants connection with you, and prayer is just connection. It's talking to him all throughout the day about your struggles, about your problems, about the good things, about the bad things. He just desires connection with you. Another thing is, man, throw some worship music on. Throw some good music on. You know, turn off the junk that you're filling yourself with, you know, um, and then put on some, like, good whole music, like lifting yourself up and going, okay, because this is what we're doing. When we're doing that, we're connecting with God. We're connecting, we're saying, God, I'm making a purposeful effort to connect with you so you can fill me up on the inside. So what's the second part of the bowl? Second part of the bowl is the inner shell, okay? That holds all of the water that I keep pouring out. So here's the second part of the solution of overcoming emptiness, okay, you ready? It's really good. Pour your life out for a mission that is bigger than yourself. Pour your life out. So here's the deal. If I have this hidden reservoir in here, but I never pour it out, it doesn't fill back up. Once I empty this, that's when it fills back up. Now, it'll fill up and it can just sit there. It can, be, can, can become stagnant. It could sit there for years. And can we just have an honest moment real quick? Some of us as Christians, we've sat for years, like a full loadable never being poured out, never being poured out. And can I challenge you today? Some of you as Christ followers, you're wondering, how come this doesn't have any life to it? How come this Christian thing doesn't have, it doesn't, it's, God says, it, you know, Jesus came to give life and life to the fullest. It doesn't feel full. Well, that's because you're not pouring yourself out. It's because you're not pouring yourself out. Because this is what happens. I'm gonna give you this water here, sweetheart. This is what happens. I pour out the water, and that's gonna, this is gonna sustain her. This is gonna give her life. So what happens, she's like, no, I wanna stand here in front of all these people for a long time. But here's the deal, okay, you guys? We are meant to be people who pour out. We're not meant to be people who just sit stagnant. God didn't give you all of the blessing. He didn't give you the time, the talent, the treasure that you have so that it can just sit in a bowl and look pretty. He gave you all those things and he did give you those things. You have them. You have them, you have time, you have talent, you have treasure, we all have them. Some of us more significantly than others, but guess what, it all matters in God's kingdom. It all matters in God's kingdom. So how do we overcome being feeling empty? We pour ourselves out. We pour ourselves out. And there's some practical ways that we do that at City First. You can serve. You can serve. You can be a generosity rock star. You can give. You know, you can be a part of legacy. You guys, there's so many things. Here's the deal. Do you know what? Do you know why God does it this way? He doesn't want to pour you out so that way he's just like, yep, I want you to be empty. No, do you see this? The more you pour out, the fuller you become. So against the way the world says it. So this is my challenge to us this week, okay, as I wrap up. I want us to all do an experiment, our own experiment this week. Our own experiment is gonna be this, okay, that we stop for this week trying to fill ourselves with all the things. Okay, some of you that are in school, you're like, that's right, I'm skipping knowledge, out of school this week. No, 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 go to school. Go to school, but this is what I'm saying. Here's the deal, let's stop trying to fill ourselves up with all this stuff, and let's have true connection with God. Do some things this week that you've never done. Turn on the worship music, open up the Bible, say, God, speak to me, God, speak to me. Maybe you're a once a month or at church. Come back next week. Let's just see what happens, okay? Let's just see what happens when we actually decide to go do a different experiment because we've all tried experimenting this life on our own. Let's see how it works God's way. 
and let's just see what happens. How can you pour out of yourself, uh, have a mission bigger than yourself this week? How can you do that? How can you help a neighbor? Maybe God's been prompting you. Become a generosity rock star. Make the next step. Here's the deal, you guys. God doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. He wants something for you. So let's take him up on his experiment. Let's do this, okay? This week's experiment. We'll put some stuff up on social media, but we're all gonna do this together. Let's not fill ourselves up with stuff from the outside, but let's say have connection with God and pour ourselves out, and let's just see what happens. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this amazing, amazing group of people. We thank you for your, <laughs> your love for us, your desire for connection with us. God, I pray that today. I pray, God, that if there are people that were in here, God, that they just need connection with you, God, I pray that they would take that next step. They would take that next step. And I'm gonna pause just real quick. If you are here in this building and you say, you know what, or you're at Cape, wherever you might be, you know, I just wanna say, if you want, you, you, maybe you've tried life on your own and it just it keeps, it's empty, it's empty, it's empty. And today you're finally hearing about the solution that's gonna fill you up. I'm telling you what, that solution is Jesus and he wants relationship with you. So if you are in here today and you would say, listen, I want relationship, I want that relationship, you know, um, at Cape, I want that relationship with Christ. If that is you, just, just slip up your hand, wherever it might be. With your head bowed and eye, all the heads bowed, all the eyes closed, just slip up your hand. I see that hand. Just keep it up. If you, I see that hand. It's awesome, you guys. Because here's the deal, it all begins with connection. So this is what we're gonna do real briefly. We're gonna say a prayer all together so that those people who raise their hand and those who are making that commitment to Christ today, that they know that they're not alone, that we are with them. So let's repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I receive Christ today. I accept his love. I accept his forgiveness, and I make Jesus the leader and the forgiver of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we just give those people that prayed that prayer a huge hand clap?